Thank you. Thank you, fellow beer lovers, which has, uh, is the only purpose for staying this late, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm doing something, this is the first time, as far as I know, it's been done. I'm going to try and live sketch some things today to map out some points. All of you can go to our corporate websites and see all this corporate stuff, and you can also go to technical papers and look at all that stuff. Um, putting them together sometimes is hard, so what I'm trying to do here today, and, and uh, so, so take it easy on me later if it fails dismally, is try and offer you something very personal, something that's from experience of my five years working in graphite and the last two years focusing very much on graphene and being fortunate enough to travel the world's um, major factories and uh, material users, shall we say, because at its root, what we're talking about here with lithium and graphite is usage of minerals in the service of humanity and hopefully in the service of all life on Earth. And we're actually part of quite a big and noble uh, and very long age tradition in getting things out of the Earth's crust, doing something useful with them. And yeah, I agree. I think uh, there's some exciting new things happening. Today, if I can tell you two or three things, two or three things you didn't know, I'll be, I'll be happy. And I will skip a lot of stuff that I think you can find elsewhere where it's a bit boring on. I'll try, as I said, focus on new things. And I'll try and illustrate things with my fancy new pen and uh, try and try and actually teach you about some of the concepts uh, in case these are not apparent because they sure as heck are new to me and uh, based on the patent side of things they are too. Um, it's interesting for me, and five years ago we went to Sweden specifically for this, um, uh, these graphite resources. We bought them off tech. Uh, but we actually pegged a load ourselves as well. Uh, tech were exploring for copper, gold and, uh, and, and zinc and they'd missed the fact that some of these graphite deposits there were quite, quite awesome. We found these historic sections, uh, a very fantastic deposit. And today, five years later, it's still the world's highest grade resource of graphite. Of course, we all know of individual veins or individual rock chips and small scale things around the world that can be high grade, but for a fully diluted Jork or NI43 resource, it surprises me somewhat that across all of the continents of the world, no one has actually put together a, a deposit that is um, higher in average grade than uh, Nunes Vara. Um, but of course, it does sit on a continuum from skinny little veins in Sri Lanka going 99% all the way to giant uh, disseminated flake style deposits uh, of uh, 2%. There are BFSs on deposits with 2%. Um, anyway, we've, we're doing something entirely different. We mine it differently, we process it differently, and we've got a totally different mindset on what we're doing with the material. We do not comply, nor have we ever really complied with what all the classic uh, flake guys are doing, classic metallurgy, um, although, of course, we have worked very closely with a lot of um, going through these uh, processes. Uh, we're in North Sweden. We've got three resources. This is a fact uh, missed by, by many uh, pundits, not just one deposit. We've actually got 28 different deposits. They contain the largest graphite resources in Europe and amongst the largest in the world. And even our Tier 2 and Tier 3 deposits are still quite high grade by other people's imaginations. Most of these were historically drilled or historically mined, and we've uh, gone on and done a little bit of drilling on them. Um, Vitangi is our main project, what we call our flagship project. Can you hear me OK, by the way? Is that right? So that's uh, 25% uh, and that sits up in the, uh, the, the northern section uh, there. And Jalkunen, uh, people forget, 31 million tonnes at just under 15% is not a bad deposit in its own right. And uh, we're actually, <coughs> that, that's just a, in the pipeline. We've also got up to a quarter of a billion tonnes in jaw compliant exploration targets. Now jaw compliant exploration targets, of course, is a pretty loose term and guaranteed to get something thrown at me by, <laughs> by some of the people in this room. Um, but they're based on drilling and trenches and historic mines and EM. It's not just EM, it's not just geophysics. And our version of conservatism for a, a company with a less than 50 million market cap is that these are from surface to 100 metres. So we don't expend them to 200 or 300. Although, frankly, let's face it, most graphite is a stratigraphic unit. Um, they're not necessarily ore bodies as such. Most things are deposits, not ore bodies. Um, so these things go down very deep. Deep isn't the problem. Size isn't the problem in, in graphite. Profitability is. So where does that sit us on the world stage? What is a little bit curious is um, even allowing for other resources that are broken up by the, um, uh, this is Gareth Hatcher's uh, group and Jack Lipton's group. Um, we still actually got quite a lot more contained graphite per tonne compared to many other resources. It's quite, it's quite a big, it's not a smooth curve, it's something extra and that's what I like. Ore bodies should be freaks. In the old days, you just had one ore body of one type of mineral per country sort of thing and now they're everywhere but um, deposits aren't necessarily ore bodies as I said. But anyway, we've got three in the top uh, 
uh, in the top resources in the world, three of the top ten, and so we can develop these projects when we need to bring them to market when we need. But it's not all about scale uh, necessarily. We've got a 20 year mine life for, from one project already. Um, Sweden, quite a nice jurisdiction. Um, we saw something earlier on um, taxes and things in different jurisdictions. Mineral production tax 0.2, Carlin Barnett, if you're listening, and corporate tax rate of 22. So sure, you have expensive sort of pension plans, superannuation plans in these ex-socialist countries, um, but since 92, when they've been privatising their mineral assets, they're actually very competitive now on a world scale. More important is the fact that it has hydroelectricity, a huge amount of it, so it's sort of like eastern Norway extended that way. Now, there are other comp uh, we have 100 kV power lines going straight through our project, bitumen roads with the highest load carrying capacity in all of Europe, uh, all the bridges are built, the railway is built. The railway is built for magnetite, so it's actually robust enough to take anything, it's not some skinny little desperate thing. A choice of ports, one deep water, so we can have cape-sized ships loading within 270 k's of the site, the railway is 20 k's from the site, the bitumen road goes through it and the power line goes through it. The power line coming from the hydroelectric scheme um, other companies in our area have published pricing of less than three cents per kilowatt hour and that's why Facebook and Google are there. Also because the grids all overlap, so they haven't had a power outage since the 70s. Okay, So this is serious quality infrastructure as well as having skilled people and a very supportive regime. Um, this is what the ore body looks like. It's, a, it's an old model but a goodie. Um, it's a single sheet uh, essentially and uh, it's very, very robust, very, very homogenous. In fact, if a cutoff grade of 10% gives us just under 10 million tonnes at 25% carbon, if we raise the cutoff grade to 20%, we lose less than 5% of our tonnes. That is quite odd. That's just to show you. Most of this thing goes 40 to 50%. The 25 is fully diluted, allowing for all sorts of goodies and taking along, you know, a healthy margin. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite quite nice. And this is borne out by exploring. Uh, there's over 32 kilometres of strike that we've mapped of the graphite unit. Uh, most of it is entirely contiguous, running through the countryside. And when I say mapped, it's from outcrops as well as EM. It's from drilling and, and our workings and mines and so forth, and that's developed the exploration targets. If you look at that little uh, ring shape there, you'll see a, essentially the graphite is draped around a an intrusion, so, so in the main part of the Tangi project, 15 k's is draped around a, a dynal intrusion. You can see that the grade of those rock chips from surface is within 1% of the resource grade. So this is a character I just want to bring up before I show you how we process it, and that's homogeneity. You need something that's extremely homogenous, and a lot of uh, graphite deposits aren't necessarily uh, like that. Here's a close-up of the EM uh, here in the, in the bottom left corner. You can see the, um, the resource area in the white, white rectangles and you can see the further EM around the north. Ignore the giant orange thing up in the top left, that's a, a magnetite deposit we own. We've also got a quarter of a billion tonnes of SCAN magnetite and also Sweden's largest cobalt deposit. But we're focusing on the graphite for now and you can see that there's a huge amount of material to bring forward over the years, so scale um, is not our problem. Now I'll just try my first little sketch to show you what this thing looks like because I don't have much geology here, I'm, I'm afraid, I've just realised. So what, what we've got is we've got our intrusion somewhere forming that domal feature and uh, we've got our graphite, our, our main graphite unit which averages 20 metres wide through, through the resource, gets up to about 50 metres wide but it averages 20 over the length of the resource and around most of 15 k's. Um, it's got a, um, a mafic tuff um, uh, hang wall uh, the foot wall is a mafic sill. Uh, it's lower amphibolite facies. I think although Mark Pierce following me is going to correct me on that. And here's our main graphite unit. Uh, but what we don't show is that there's actually another, and, and this graphite unit grades about, uh, say, call it 20 to 50 percent carbon. What we don't show is that there's actually another unit that sits parallel in the foot wall zone. It's a little bit skinnier, but it's pretty much, uh, it's very, very close to it. And this unit is called the low-grade unit, and that averages based on our drilling and other uh, uh, material, it's 10 to 20%. And the current resource is developed just on that one unit uh, over here, and that is um, just the jaw indicated part of that resource. Oh, and I should point out too that these um, intrusions have got chalka pirate in them, some of them, so they're quite, quite interesting for the future. So, what are we doing differently? Here's our um, trial mine that we opened up in 2015. Uh, why are we cutting it with a uh, saw blade? It's because we want the rocks to be whole. We're not really mining graphite, we're carving electrodes. 
we use a processing technique called electrochemical exfoliation. We're actually going to run an electric current through the ore and we're going to drive ions in a liquid in between the individual atoms of the rock to split off the layers of graphite, which are called graphene. And you get prices of graphite, from 500 to you know, $1,000, call it, call it 300 to to $1,000 for graphite. If you add more value to that graphite through spherical, you can get more for it. Uh, graphene pricing starts at, well, right now it's pretty hard to say, but in our scoping study, uh, we, had, uh, we used a quarter of the lowest price for the worst product we could find in the world, uh, which was $55,000 US a tonne. And uh, it's really running up around where silver is, colloidal silver right now for inkjet, uh, printing is um, you know, up around uh, $9 million a tonne. So uh, that's that's why we do it. So we mine uh, whole blocks, and uh, this year we, we did something different. We've upgraded the equipment. We've made it larger. We use cable saws as well. This one's doing a vertical cut to prepare the trial mine, but what we're doing is we um, cut the blocks. Uh, here's about 90 blocks on a, on a bench. Uh, with a dual bladed unit this year, it's a bit bigger, it's a three metre diameter wheel, we bring them in from China, we've done special work to get the blades to cut the graphite uh, and it goes really fast, you can actually get about 90 blocks of seven tonnes each um, cut and sliced ready to go within about three days once you've got a bench prepared. So full scale production for our, our mine which we put into a scoping study in 2014 is based actually on a, on a coring method, this means there's no drilling and no blasting of the ore which keeps all the dust down and the locals love it, and the permitting loves it, and that's why we we're within nine months we we're able to get a trial mining permit uh, in a, in an advanced Western country. And quarries don't have to be small, by the way. So if anyone's saying, "Hey, what a stupid, expensive, difficult method for large scale extraction," it doesn't have to be uh, that way. I'm not saying this is what ours will look like. With walls, I'll, we'll see what we can get away with. Uh, interestingly, our stripping ratio, which was in the scoping study, was about four to one, which was based on standard uh, drill and blast and stuff. So with the quarry, you can really trim it down. When you're inside those mafic units to the graphite, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a one millimetre contact zone. It's that sharp. So you can trim it down really, really fast. So there's a little bit on the deposit. Um, we're in Europe. Uh, floated here, obviously, in 2010. We just had our sixth year anniversary. Company's still growing. It's about 800% bigger than it was when we started. And we are processing in Germany. Why? Because, as mentioned uh, by my esteemed colleagues earlier, um, Europe is actually a really good market. It imports 90% of its graphite, and it's got a huge amount of people there, a huge amount of uh, money being spent, and fortunately for us, a huge amount of governments that love the idea of electrification of cars. VW, of course, now is madly fixing up its reputation by building battery plants everywhere um, with the help of uh, LG coming in uh, to, to Germany. I just got back with uh, some of my colleagues from Daimler, uh, Daimler's battery factory in near Dresden, which is uh, very close to our pilot uh, plant facility there, which we built for this very reason in, in that part of former East Germany. And uh, to see a three-pointed star for Mercedes on something without wheels is sort of a big deal. Their, their, their Tesla-like Powerwall units will be available here in Australia next year, they tell me. And the commitment we've seen in their battery factory, the way they build their packs and uh, the technology behind it, it is next generation, I agree. And it's, it's uh, going faster than you think. When Mercedes, someone, when you think about Mercedes, someone that was fundamentally part of the diesel engine being created 120 years ago, and now they're actually selling uh, battery systems for houses. And it's not just a side product, it's quite a significant shift in uh, but what, what they're just, some, some industrialists are deciding to do. Never mind Toyota, Ford, GM, everyone else uh, that we meet. And software companies, Google, are doing it, of course, because they've got driverless cars. And um, so it's not just about Tesla, it's about everyone else as well. And it's about Apple as well. Well, our friends, so why are we in Germany? We're in this former industrial estate. Why? Because we're undertaking a, a brand new process. It's uh, something that we patented about a year and a half ago. So when that's granted, it'll be interesting to, uh, to look at it. So what... what access Telga shareholders have to uh, royalties from other people's operations trying to duplicate this. But what we're doing is we're uh, taking our, our graphite ore, we're slicing it up into blocks um, and we're putting it through a process, which I can't show you a lot about, but I'm going to tell you about sort of roughly how it works. Um, there's obviously a lot of secret squirrel stuff to do with how it's done. And obviously in the early stages, a lot of people then doubt it because you can't show them all the details. But we've spawned already quite a few uh, companies trying to duplicate this. So anyway, in that, in that building... What you can see here at the top right is where we the graphite's processed into graphene and graphite products. So for us, 
it's not just graphene. We make graphite with a graphene byproduct, or you can spin it the other way around. It's just a matter of money. But we do a process uniquely directly on our raw rock straight from the ground uh, with no crushing and grinding, and that um, liberates this, this black stuff in these bottles down there. That's actually a, a product going to a customer for prototyping. It's not a graphene uh, concentrate. It's not a graphite concentrate. It's actually a... Uh, it's a product that some of you are using right now in this room, I notice, and it's uh, using uh, the graphene in that coating uh, within that product. Um, so, so you can actually make stuff out of it at all sorts of scales. So I think it's very useful. You can drive revenue during the pilot plant phase instead of waiting for full-scale production, which in our case was going to cost less than 30 million Australian dollars anyway, based on the scoping study in 2014. So let me get back to uh, not boasting, but telling you something uh, different. So graphite and graphene, what's the difference? Um, let me pause at this point and show you something about graphite versus graphene. Let's see if this can work with another one here. So uh, if you measure, let's say, electrical conductivity down one side, and we'll measure on the other side, I uh, haven't actually thought about it yet, but we'll measure something on that side. You'll, um, graphene, let's down the bottom, we'll have how many layers you have of graphene, of graphene. So one single layer of atoms is called graphene, and it has the highest conductivity of anything on Earth. And two layers of graphene will have slightly less conductivity, and so forth. And five layers may have this much conductivity. Now graphite, one millimetre of graphite contains three million layers. Three million layers. So if they were playing cards, if they were a pack of cards and you've got 52 cards and one single card is graphene, you take that out, you say, great. If you have three million cards, it's three times the height of the Eiffel Tower. There's a big difference. Atoms are a massively different world. The world of nano is on the edge of perception. It's like you're trying to argue with someone non-geological in your family about the age of the Earth and stuff with deep time. It's just beyond, right? There's, there's no human way to get it. It's the same with atoms. That's why in the graphing world we end up with all these stupid diagrams and stupid um, you know, discussions about playing cards. Um, it is hard to get just how massively thin that is. So, so in, a, in a micron, uh, so, so we're talking about one billionth of a metre uh, would have three layers of, of graphene. So this stuff's really, really small. Now, so what happens is the electrical side, the, the very, very high conductivity, the highest in the world. Now, graphite is very conductive. It's in electric engines, it does all sorts of things. So the conductivity, though, compared to graphene is a lot lower, and it shoots up like that. So let's just stick to conductivity as our measure. These are supposed to be lightning bolts, but that's worse than you saying bolt getting drunk. So now it's super electricity. Um, Okay, so, so graphite is conductive as compared to a piece of paper or a piece of wood. Awesome. Graphene is so massively more, more. Now, what happens in between? This is where, this is the conductivity of graphite. But what about if you've got 20 layers? 20 layers is massively different to 3 million layers. It actually is more conductive. It has entirely different properties. So are you still calling it graphite or are you calling it graphene? Well, it's not graphite, but it's not single layer. It's multi-layer graphene. So there's a whole other world of discussion because there's no standards in this young, young, young uh, industry. What do you call that? Well, it's, it's multi-layer graphene. It's 20 layers. So I personally, the way we work is, you know what? We don't worry about it too much. We listen to what the customer tells us. If the customer calls something with 20 layers graphene, graphene nanoplatelet as versus a sheet, that's fine. That, as long as it works, what are you willing to pay for it? Oh, well, I'm willing to pay you $50,000 a tonne if it's delivered in this way. Great, awesome, let's make that. And how hard is it to make that? Well, it's actually pretty hard. That's why there hasn't been a lot of it made before. Ten years ago they discovered it. Now product, worldwide production is probably up to 1,000 tonnes. And growing, it's going to be 4,000 tonnes soon. But, of course, bearing in mind that a lot of graphene works at additive levels of less than 1%. So the amount of material you can make with that is very high. And one layer of graphene is very, very expensive. So does that help maybe demystify a little bit in that you've got... A few layers of graphene are still graphene in that they're not graphite. So a Nobel Prize winner will say, no, single layer must be this, this is multi-layer, few layer. So there is some terminology behind it, but the point is you're now no longer in the world of multi-micron size uh, graphite. I hope that was worth the effort. This is what it looks like if you let a graphic designer um, get onto it. And I'll see if I can make a drawing on this. No, I can't. But on the right, what you can see is 
And as far as I know, this is the first slide in the world that's tried to make a, uh, an argument all the way from nano to large flake. So flake size, on the right, you've got the size of the market. On the left, you've got price per tonne. These are all in log scales. And along the bottom, you've got sizing in log scales. The blue bars at the bottom are Telgas projects. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the, where the orange bars are, you can see jumbo flake, large flake coming down to fine flake, i.e. You know, amorphous. And uh, at about, uh, what, $300, $400 per tonne. And then something interesting happens. When it gets smaller, price goes up. Who knew? Uh, battery stuff, battery grade graphite, it's 15 microns. It's not jumbo. It's not whatever. What's that stuff worth? Well, it's worth more money. Why? Because you have to pour more energy into making it small, right? It sounds simple, but everyone forgets. There's a whole other world of small stuff. The problem is it's hard to make stuff small. You saw Peter Adamini's graph that might have shocked some of you about how much energy it took to grind graphite. Not only that, it's worse, folks. If you grind the heck out of, out of, a, out of graphite in a bore mill, it loses crystallinity. It becomes truly amorphous, not graphite. You can turn it into coal if you bore mill it enough. Little known fact, there's a scientific paper I can give to you on that and the experiments. So you're smashing the crystallinity up and that decreases. So ideally what you would have is a method to, with the least number of steps, generate very few layers of graphite, free from gang minerals, and be able to recover them with no milling, no crushing, and none of all the other nasty stuff that happens. And you'll be able to do something about that in, um, in, on a bulk scale. Bulk scale. Okay, so 5,000 tonnes a year or something isn't going to cut it. It's going to have to be bigger. So pricing goes up exponentially the smaller it gets. So we found uh, in early 2014, as Peter mentioned, we uh, discovered a uh, technique called electrochemical exfoliation. Electrochemical exfoliation was originally developed, uh, let's see, originally developed for this stuff, which is synthetic graphite. So this is 99.9% .9 synthetic graphite. Half of the world's graphite market is synthetic. Scary. Anyway, there you go, it's great, it's made from petroleum waste and of course it does things that are pretty obvious which is it conducts electricity pretty well. If I can wrangle this, there we go, it's conducting electricity. So what we were doing, when we were doing some metallurgy, we were looking at our core and someone says that core looks suspiciously like synthetic graphite, in fact they almost look identical. So we said, oh, we did something, we did some tests on just how conductive it was and we found that it lights up very, very well. In fact there's really no difference in resistivity. And in fact, there's a benefit to the natural material because that's got flakes of graphene in it. And actually, most synthetic doesn't make little flakes, can't make graphene at all. Anyway, the scientists had discovered a method that if you, and I should show you that method potentially now. And this is what it looks like, actually. I'll just show you the method. Cue, nice music, <coughs> and um, words coming out of the background saying, bye, Talga shares, quickly before Mark does something clever. So what we're going to show is actually uh, a video that dates back far enough that we don't think it uh, uh, infringes or, or stuffs up on, on anything we're doing in, the, in patent land. And it's specifically showing you just how bog sample it is. Since then, there's a video you can go on YouTube and you can actually see me doing this where I get a rock from the ground and we actually do it with a car battery uh, using some items that we're sitting around with some investors and uh, responding to a challenge. Uh, we do it on the roadside with the materials we have in the back of the car, like MacGyver. So what we're doing is we're here, we're, for the first time in the world, you're taking a rock straight from the ground, running electric current through it, and we're driving ions into the graphite, which are now being sheared off and exfoliated down to individual atoms. So you can reduce seven ton blocks down to individual atoms for the first time with no crushing and no grinding. So you're not impacting on the crystallinity. Now when I say little atoms, I mean literally atoms. So the stuff that's colloidal, that black stuff sitting in the water that, that won't drop, it won't drop in three months either because there's no mass. It's graphene. The stuff that's heavier is your multi-layer material like your graphite and also your waste products. That drops to the bottom and then you suck them off from there. So you, you extract the different bits from the column, as it were, of the material. Now, developing a process like that to an industrial scale would normally be ridiculous for a small company to take on. But A, it works. B, you'll notice that it's not in a stainless steel tube. There's no pressure. You'll notice there's nothing heating it up. There's no temperature required. It's in a clear glass jar. It's actually in a little shed, our little skunk works down in somewhere here in Perth. And that's just an example of how simple it is. And of course now we've scaled that up to a much bigger um, thing. So what the heck is going on? Let me, let me show you what is really happening. So what is happening is that the layers 
These layers are 0.34 of a nanometer apart, your little graphite, it's pretty small. They're held together, as we heard earlier, by a very weak electrostatic force called the Van der Waals force. And it's very weak. So graphite's slippery because these things just slide off and they, this force can break. Problem is if you want to break it in a controlled way. Anyway, so what we do is you put this in a liquid. And what we do is, there's in the liquid, we get an ion designed to be the exact same diameter as the Van der Waals gap in between the layers. That comes in here, and then we propagate little gas bubbles around it to get it started faster, and it goes boop, and this will travel along that layer. They'll travel down here, unzipping as they go, and these layers will jump off, and they'll float around two layer, one layer, five layer, 10 layer, 50 layer. But you'll have a certain amount of graphene of different qualities, all the way up to graphite. What's interesting is in this deposit, it's exactly the opposite of large flake. We've never cared less, more or less about large flake in our lives. This thing is mostly less than 15 microns. In fact, about D90 is about 10 micron. So it's really, really small. But the beauty of it is 10 microns is a big graphene flake. It's actually a big graphene particle. It's hard for scientists to make. There's no big industrial processes for making it. Well, if we go back to the video, do you think we could scale that up? Yep, we can. And we have. So we've got a pilot plant operating in phase two. That is taking 50 kilo blocks and dissolving them. We're doing about 350 kilos a week uh, currently of, of ore, and it's modular, so we can just continue scaling that up to different sizes. Um, you can use the graphite ore as an anode or a cathode, sometimes as both. I won't reveal too much about the details, but here you can see we've got also partnerships with uh, a recent one with uh, Cambridge Uni, Max Planck Institute of Polymer Research, who we work very closely with, and the Uni of Dresden and another uni in, uh, in uh, Jena, Frederick Schiller, and it's, there's exfoliation, here's some graphene, Raman spectrometry, and then of course you've got beneficiation, which is more of a challenge. So we've got a new process, and sure, there's technological challenges and we've got to scale it up, but look at the potential benefits. that You could do 250,000 tonnes a year of ore, which only costs you less than $30 million to set up that mine, and you could be producing something that the, in the last scoping study had an MPV of just under $500 million massive leverage because you've got a freak deposit and you've matched it with a really freaky uh, processing uh, method which skips this, which is the high energy cost. That energy is exponentially increasing to make something smaller and we don't have to do that. We've Then I'll talk briefly about batteries. Thank you, excellent, very generous. On the left, uh, standards for ionisation. You have to crush and grind through stages, float it, and then of course you get that concentrate and you've got to micronize it You've got to purify it further or shape it specifically and you've got to coat it and you can put it into a battery. And a standard lithium-ion battery is about 360 milliamp hours. Um, we uh, didn't bother doing any of that. We actually took our sludge, as it were, our, our micro-graphite. We didn't even concentrate it into graphene and we just used it straight up and it worked. We also got 360 milliamp hours. So I had the embarrassment recently of being at the Benchmark Minerals Tour in, uh, in London and uh, UBS-sponsored... Uh, conference and a, a guy from the battery department at the Uni of Cambridge uh, got up during question time and said, I don't understand why you're going on about flake size when previously everyone used 100 micron flake anyway and now, now you, can, you don't have to use anything. Um, and there was a bit of a stunned silence in, in the room. I've, uh, of course, approached him and given him a job since. But uh, he, he really got it, that, that you don't have to. You never did. The anisotropy you, you suffer from uh, using flakes 20, 30, 40 years ago, it doesn't matter anymore. We've actually got techniques where we can align the flakes directly. So spherical's sort of optional. So what does that mean? Um, have I got something here on the market? Maybe there's something on graphene. Um, OK, here's, here's how we're going to make stuff. So what it means is that we already cut open batteries and find that non-spherical material is being used. I'm not here to bag spherical. Um, Panasonic wants spherical. Everyone who's doing current stuff wants spherical. There's also groups that don't. Uh, this is our new chief technology officer. He was a graphene scientist for Tata, who we've got an MOU with, and he's um, left them to join us, which was nice. And what we're doing is through skills of people like that, those management skills, um, that if we go back uh, to the talk this morning um, uh, by Sykes uh, and et al, um, is that you need management, you need technology, you need a whole range of things to sort of bring industrial minerals together pretty well. I'm not saying we're succeeding, but we're now adding the coating side of it. We're turning, so we've got multi-layer graphite, we turn it into a few layer graphene, we chemically modify it, and we get a product. In this case, we've got a conductive anti-corrosion coating. Um, Tata 
control 40% of the world's global wire market. Most of that material is not in fencing wire and chicken coops, it's actually in radial tyres, steel radial tyres. Currently, the steel wires are coated with bronze, essentially, to um, cope with the corrosion aspect between the carbon and the rubber and, and, the, uh, and the wire corroding. So if you can replace that with a graphene-based coating, you've potentially got... That's just one single little, little product. There's a lot of tonnes, obviously, in tyres. It also can make them lighter, and also they like it because they don't control the world's zinc market, but they could have a big stake in a graphene producer like Talga. So that, that's the sort of ordinary thing. Uh, most people don't know why tyres are black. Uh, because if you didn't put carbon black into them, they would be white, they would be grey, but they, they would have terrible friction characteristics, terrible length. Carbon black can be replaced by graphene in tyres. So we're actually looking at the whole automotive chain. We can go after batteries, we can also do the wiring, we can save 60 kilos of weight of copper in a Mercedes S-Class uh, by printing the circuitry into plastic and that becomes the underseat heating because as much as you want an electric car to feel good about the environment and all that, and also they do perform beautifully, I must say, um, you also want a warm butt in the Northern Hemisphere because it's too cold. So we're focusing on four products, coatings, energy, conductives and construction, which is conductive <coughs> cement, conductive inks, which is all things I just told you about, batteries and corrosion, which is um, easily deliverable. I just want to point out our um, battery tests um, we're just coin cells, but we're now upgrading them at the University of Warwick's Energy Innovation Centre uh, that does work for groups like Dyson and other interesting uh, groups who are getting into the battery business. And we actually are making larger scale pouch batteries and running them for multiple cycles, and we're seeing good results. Um, a little sneaky uh, plug here. This is uh, one of the largest battery manufacturing plants in the world. It's currently already doing over 20 uh, gig. It's in southeastern China, and I noticed on a visit recently, I couldn't help but notice, but even in their foyer, if you look in the bottom right corner there, there's a graphic which you, you, you can't read it. In the red dot it says silica carbon composite. Okay, they're making silicon anodes for next generation. So the beauty of um, current, again, graphite spheres go into one, well, one form of, 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 of anode. But what if the technology changes? What if they start using silicon? What then? What, what does it mean for your lifelong investment? And at some of our ages, do we really want to spend the rest of our lives working on something that may be gone in five years or ten years' time? I want to be exposed to things that have got long-term possibilities and long-term growth. And one of them is, is that's the beauty of graphene. It can be used as an additive into, into silicon. That's how you can make silicon anodes. Most battery technologies, in fact, use uh, graphene in them of the new generation technologies as compared to the historic stuff. And I'm done, if there's enough time for questions. Thank you.